welcome to the Sound of the Basketball. I'm back here with Chris. How are you, Chris? Good morning, James. Good to see you, Chris. So this morning, um, you introduced me to some work from the great Arj Barker, who had said that podcasts are very informative <laughs> and uh, in the context of uh, a quite a good piece on gluten-free. So um, if you do uh, want to have a little bit of a laugh, have a listen to Arj Barker on um, being gluten-free, which uh, I have some sympathy for. So um, we'll be talking about things during the course of the year. I came in with some, funnily enough, gluten-free uh donuts this morning and uh, we laughed about the fact that one of the case studies we've talked about is bread donuts and wholemeal donuts. Uh, well, funnily enough, our good friends at Dodo have done quite well for us this morning, so I recommend them as well. So, Chris, we've talked a little bit before about the, the Lemony Sniggets, or what it was. We can probably go back to that one again yeah. briefly, but what I'm talking about, but a sequence of unfortunate events. However, you think this time you've got a good news story about how, despite a sort of a bunch of cataclysms in a row, something and we had a happy news story for this time of the year. So talk us through what you had in mind. Yeah, it's, this is one of those, this is, would be an extremely rare circumstance. And when I mean extremely rare is that the company was put into liquidation by court order. That's not the rare part no, about no, it. No. But by application of the liquidator after that appointment time, the liquidator applied to the court to actually stop the winding up and hand the company back to the director. That's the extremely rare element of it. And the reason, uh, which is obviously how the story ends, <laughs> but um, we, which is a bit strange. Why, don't we, why are we starting with the ending of the story yeah, at wow. the beginning? But it's like one of those really interesting <laughs> films where you see the end at the beginning and you go, hang on, how the hell did this possibly happen? Maybe this, this never happens. This yeah. will be a Quentin Tarantino yeah, podcast. Yeah, 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 We're going to yeah. start with the end and then we're going to work through yeah, the, the beginning. Yeah. The awesome. Well, perhaps the moral of the story will play itself out as you talk us through the different sequence. There seems to be a few morals to this story, but anyway, let's let's weave us through the story. So <laughs> we've got, a, story. We've got yep. this uh, an amazing bluebird, incredible outcome, where director walks off into the night, liquidator goes home, most people are mostly happy. Is that right? I mean, the liquidator still got the business is still got still going. The director still got his company. There was a there was a price to that the director had to pay right to get his company back. So that that potentially makes him a little bit unhappy. But one thing he didn't lose he, is there was no asset loss uh, from the company. Right, and cash. <laughs> and the only <laughs> other thing that really kind of did upset the director was that because of the way this company was structured and the finance behind it, the the bank behind his company did lift his interest rate a couple of percentage points because the bank felt there was a little element of risk here. So instead, instead of giving him mates rates, interest rates, they actually bumped it up a couple of percentage points. So naturally, that then ate into profits. He was still making great money. It just made it good money instead of great. Right. Okay. Yeah. But in terms of that versus somebody else owning all what he's built up over the years. Yeah, or vaporising all of those assets on the open market. In terms of that mm. scenario, this is a good outcome. How could this happen? Yeah, well, this is the this is where the series of unfortunate events sort of cut, starts to kick in. And so just remind us of the Lemony Snickets. I know we've talked about it before, but just give us a quick pricey on the why I'm referring to that. So there's a scenario in that particular case. It's, it's literally just called a sequence of unfortunate events. In this particular case, unlike the Lemony Snicket story, there's no kind of protagonist caught potentially causing the problem in the background this time, is there? There's just... Literally a sequence of... It's a sequence of unfortunate events. Yeah, it's not like... Uh, so so I think we better start the story yeah. Quentin Tarantino style. So yeah, we can, yeah. yeah. So the story begins pre-GFC. So we're going yeah. back to, you know, pre-2008. And our fellow happens to be in uh, lots of... He, this company happened to own a lot of commercial properties. So he was a landlord. And, and prior to GFC, he was custom building some commercial tenancies for some fairly blue chip customers right and i guess we we ironically say blue chip is one of those solid blue chips that mm. just can't, doesn't go away they're like a bank they're safe as houses mm. you know that kind of stuff ironically this involves a company called one steel right who were big at the time yes and uh so prior to gfc they've approached this director and said hey we want to position a commercial slash warehouse slash semi-industrial place right in the, um, the Sunshine Coast of Queensland because of massive growth opportunities there because that, they, they were just building, you know, estates upon estates upon hospitals, shopping mm. centers, the whole lot. So one still said we need a presence there. Prior to GFC, they approached our director and they wanted the director to build them a custom 
sort of commercial tenancy and now the director agreed. And that introduction was made via a commercial real estate agent. So a commercial real estate agent introduces one deal to our director. Then GSC hits. And all of a sudden, all investment and all sort of, hey, all expenditure, anything outside the ordinary was pretty much shut down almost across the board. So yeah. one still says to the commercial real estate agent and to our director, sorry, guys, GFC, we don't know how we're going to survive. So we're going to down tools on this deal and the deal ends. So our director's lost one steal as a client. Uh, the real estate agent has, has lost out on commissions because, you know, unfortunately, the deal didn't go ahead. Three years later... The economy is changing for the better. One Steel now wants to reignite that same deal. So One Steel goes direct to our director and says, hey, remember that deal we talked about three years ago? We'd like to do it right now. And of course, the deal gets done. The, the building gets built, leases get signed, and everyone's happy little camper. Except three years later, yeah. the commercial agent that originally introduced One Steel to our director fires in an invoice for $75,000 odd dollars to the director saying, hey, remember how we introduced you to that guy three years ago? Well, we understand you've now done a deal with that same client. So guess what? You now owe us $75,000. So I think we should use the introductory music for this and I'll see if we can to what about me? <laughs> it isn't fair. It isn't fair. <laughs> Had enough. Yeah. I want my share. Okay, yeah. Because, I mean, it's whilst it's three years done, you can see both sides of the coin. But anyway, so anyway, what about me? Would I be right in thinking that if someone feels a bit grieved and they start using legal process, you've got to be a little bit careful as a director in that situation? If, if you... Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's lots of tools that are available to a mm. creditor to get their debts paid, right? Yeah. And, and some tools require a court process, you know, claim, statement of claim, let's bash it out in court, let's get a judgment debt. Once mm. we've got the judgment debt, then we can do all sorts of wonderful things, mm. right? But this guy was fairly aggressive. This commercial real estate agent pretty much went straight for a statutory demand under the Corporations Act. So once a statutory demand is served on the company, and in this case, uh, you only have to get it to the registered office, you then have 21 days in order to pay that demand before the company will then be deemed insolvent to then trigger the application to wind up the company. So that's real aggressive legal steps that are in place. But of course, the $75,000 debt, once you then submit your statutory demand, it then will add legal fees and interest to that demand. And of course, now all of a sudden, the 75 grand has now increased. So, so it's sort of like a rolling stone. Kind of. It gathers moss. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or something like that, you know what I mean? Or a snowball or an avalanche or something. So if there's an avalanche with one snowball coming down the hill, to use a better analogy, if you're getting a credit of statutory demand, it's already starting to gather a bit of momentum. You don't want to be the skier skiing through the valley with this avalanche Snowball is starting to come down, getting bigger and bigger. You've probably seen a sign saying, warning, avalanche. So what you wouldn't do is just ignore it or ask somebody to do something about it. Yeah, statutory demands are they're, they're effectively a tool to get the company to be deemed insolvent by the non-payment of that specific debt. So in other words, I, I'm going to give you a statutory demand under the Corpse Act. You've got 21 days. If you don't pay it, it will deem the company insolvent. And once you've got that deeming provision there, well, then the next step is you go to the court and you say, Your Honour, it's pretty clear this company's insolvent. Relevant. Look at the demand at the I demand gave them and, and, and it and got they, ignored. They nothing. Therefore, the court must assume that the company's insolvent. In the absence of any other information. That That's otherwise. right. And it is a rebuttable presumption. So you can defend it by providing a solvency report that says, Hey, actually, Your Honour, uh, I've missed this document, but hey, look at our look but at the you, health of it. But our... you have to actually prove innocence in that correct, situation. Correct, correct. Yeah, You're yes. guilty until proven innocent. Yeah, right. Okay. Correct. So lesson one from maybe today's podcast, other than don't go through avalanches, uh, that you can get good gluten-free stuff, is probably the main lesson so far is do not ignore a credit as statutory demand. That's probably the, a good le one of the good lessons people will learn from this. And then if you said, okay, I'm not ignoring it, but oh my uh, my you know oh, a mate can do something like is, is there sort of a the right place to go to get advice if you get one of those things? The first person you should be calling once you get a statutory demand has to be your lawyer. Like you just uh, you just don't call anybody else. Don't even call your wife. Don't call your kids. Yeah, yeah. You go straight to your lawyer. And then I've hassled you before because you talked about having a good lawyer and a good accountant on speed dial if you're a savvy mm -hmm. business. A lot of business people such as myself don't have. 
you know, they might talk to the accountant once a year when they've got to pay their annual returns and that sort of yeah. stuff. And, and, and they may not even trust their accountant to provide them business savvy advice. So I may not have a lawyer on tap. What would I not do potentially in that situation is if I get a creditor statutory demand, do I, I, you wouldn't just send it to anybody. No, I mean, look, if your accountant is, your, is a trusted advisor, you know, someone that you sort of liaise with throughout the year, that'd and, be good. and they'll know somebody. They'll know somebody, yeah. yeah. Right. Worst case scenario, geez, go to the well, Queensland Law Society. Well, I mean, you could phone you, you could phone you guys. I mean, you could phone Insolver, Solvers.com, yeah, that's kind of what yeah. we do. Definitely get phone it, but you've got to find someone reputable. So flicking it off to a relative to try and sort out for you. Yes. So uh, this is the next series of the yeah, unfortunate yeah. events. Yeah, yeah. So our fellow, our director, who's just received uh, an invoice that he disputes, he says, no, I'm not paying it because, hey, we lost that deal three years ago. They called me direct. I didn't need you to set up this second deal. So, you know, I'm disputing the debt, right? Morally I, and ethically, I, d- I don't want to pay it, right? But the problem is... And this is probably in the, the devil's in the detail. Real estate agents, when they, when you sign them up to be your agent, there is a period where it is an exclusive agency, usually about 90 days. And then if you don't terminate their agreement, it flicks over to an open agency with no end date on it. So if you think about it, our commercial agent was once upon a time the exclusive agent to find a tenant. It's then gone beyond the 90 days. It's then technically become an open agency and it hasn't ended. In other words, the real estate agent is still the agent appointed to find a tenant. Looking back in hindsight, if our director had have terminated the agency agreement when the GFC came in... He could have sent an email. You would not have this problem. He could have literally sent an email. He could have sent an email in writing saying, I'm terminating formally commercial agency agreement. So then he said, okay, I know a lawyer. Yep. He can sort it out. Yep. The lawyer happened to be the director's brother-in-law. Right. The brother-in-law happened to practice in like suburbia somewhere. Usually suburban lawyers, and I'm not uh, being too generous here, but they specialise in family law, wills and estates, and maybe crash and bash yeah. type law. You know, most of your litigators and your, your fighters and all are generally based in the city. Um, so he's given it to his brother-in-law who may be a wills and estates for a family law guy. And of course, he doesn't understand the importance of it. It goes into his inbox. But of course, the GFC causes this guy's practice to be impacted. So he needs to feed his family. So the brother-in-law lawyer has now disappeared to the mines so he can earn an oh, income no. for his family. And this so, statutory demand and correspondence is all sitting in this guy's in-tray. But not only that, his brother-in-law lawyer that's now gone to the mines to earn a decent income is also in the process of selling his legal practice to someone else. So, of course, when he sells, all the files get taken over by the new legal entity. And, of course, now we've got the document sitting in the inbox that's been ignored or, or missed by the brother-in-law gets transferred over to the new Which legal is basically firm. a ticking time bomb. It's a ticking time bomb. Sitting in somebody's in-tray. Correct. Or like an archive box. And then, of course... So, then it, so basically, it's done what ticking time bombs do. They blow up. It blows up. Yeah. And so, lo and behold, it's cab rank rule. You and colleagues, your turn. Quarter points, you guys. Correct. So the commercial agent who lodged the uh, invoice, who then lodged the statutory demand that obviously got ignored then goes and applies to wind up the company because it's now deemed insolvent and then one of my long-time mentors and predecessors got the appointment and I was working for her at the time so we get this appointment it's usually on a Friday afternoon the court appointed uh, liquidations come in I think I instructed uh, one of our sort of admin guys to go and give us just just randomly I said look I think you should do a property search just to tick that box in our investigations yes we've looked at property and there's nothing there turns out though on the Monday we get the property search back and this thing's got 25 properties on it (laughs) right and all of a sudden we've gone oh my god this company may have some substance to it we then start doing searches in the in each of these sort of 25 properties and we're starting to realize the majority of them are commercial tenancies where this guy is effectively the landlord and then we start getting in the bank statements. We start to look through going, wow, there's actually cash flow starting to come in from all the tenants. And he's able to meet his banking commitments on time. And there's actually a, sur- a good surplus, a nice healthy surplus from him being a landlord. So we go and fly up and meet the director who happened to be um, in central Queensland there, living a good life, beautiful tan, Hawaiian shirt, thongs, you know, shorts, like this guy. Yeah, yeah. He's, if you look at him in the street, you just pass him and you go, oh, yeah, that's just, uh, you know, average average Joe Bill. You yeah, know. Loving the, living the dream. Yeah, happy day. <laughs> joke. Yeah. And, and we're, we then work out, we said, this guy's sitting on $30 million worth of real estate. But it's not just $30 million worth of real estate. It's $30 million of cash generating real estate. Like, that's a difference. Yeah, it's not like a patch of land that's got 
trees and no. car bodies on it. No, this, this, yeah. And so we're starting to work out, one, this company is now cash flow positive. And number two, when you look at the asset value and you minus the secured debt to it, he's, he's actually, I, I think he's, I think he's worth about, you know, 10 plus million bucks net assets. So we're the liquidators of this company that has 25 properties generating, you know, X million in revenue, uh, surplus cash year on year with net assets of 10 million bucks. On a credited statutory demand of 75 grand. Correct, correct. And this is where, uh, working with the liquidator here, we made the decision we have to terminate this winding up because this company is actually solvent. And we wrote our own uh, solvency report to the court to say, look, Your Honour, look at the cash flow it generates, look at the net asset position. Our view is, and this is us as liquidators, our view is this company is solvent. So you have to actually write in court to apply to get yourself, single inverted commas, dismissed. Yeah, terminate the terminate winding up. Terminate the winding up. Because this guy's not skint, he's just got to get his act together. Yeah, the, the reason the company went into insolvency is the series of unfortunate events where wow. he handed the thing to his brother-in-law who didn't do the right thing by him, and it's been missed, it's been lost, all the time periods expired, and the creditor or the commercial agent had no other option. He had to go to court to wind him up. So here's a lesson about it. There's a few, so we've listened about do not ignore ticking time bombs, seek advice from the right places. Some good news around the fact that the liquidator can be your friend if you're completely upfront, honest, talk about the process. It's not because, I mean, nothing gives you greater joy than to be able to walk away from a place that's making money and employing people. Actually, I'm glad you said that. One thing about this director, he was brutally honest. He was he was almost, if anything, it was potentially he was oversharing. <laughs> yeah, right. like, but the point being is we now ended up on the same page. He didn't like the situation he's in and he wanted he's happy to pay all his bills and get out of it we realized this winding up shouldn't continue on because if we start imagine if we started selling off all those assets for no real benefit like who who benefits there maybe our fees etc but it doesn't help him and the bank was actually comfortable with this guy because the bank's sitting there going well our loan to value ratio is good the cash flow is still good he's meeting all his mortgage commitments on time we're not going to make uh, any sudden moves and put receives in. There's no point to do that. So a pretty happy ending. I mean, a little bit of skin off the director's nose, a bit of a kick up the pants about, hey, you can't let these things ride. Obviously, you, you maybe some of the covenants and stuff like that over that would have been reviewed if you had to kind of fork out some cash. Yeah. Obviously, the liquidator still needs to be paid, so there's yeah. a lot of money, legal fees. He's obviously the whole opportunity to argue or the toss on the... Real estate, that's kind of done and dusted. Look, suck it up, away you go, pay and pay the costs, I imagine, for the... Yeah, so so the court order that the court made was along these lines. One, that the termination, uh, sorry, to terminate the winding up. Two, that the director had to pay the fees of the liquidator. And let's just say, uh, in loose terms, it was about uh, 300 uh, odd thousand, including our lawyer's fees, because we had to engage lawyers to, course, to yeah. run this thing. So let's just call that 300 grand. He then had to pay the original $75,000 invoice plus interest, plus that guy's legal costs, mm. plus the cost of winding it up originally. So let's just say that turned out to be over about 100, 120. So you got 300 to liquidate, you got 120 to the original creditor who mm. sued him for 75,000, and then plus the cost of the day incidental to terminating the winding up. So when you added it all up, we, we, it's about a 400 to $500,000 bill to get out of paying a $75,000 invoice. And is there a lesson there about sort of dealing with relatives? I mean, clearly we've often talked about things kind of evolve. So here's a bloke who's been a pretty savvy investor, but he's probably not increased the sophistication of his kind of structure. No, it definitely the, wasn't sophisticated. Or, or, no. the, or the, so, and we've talked about before where, you know, you know, famous situations where like a large transactions and you've had to write out a check to the individual who owns these assets because they've got no sophistication of their structure. We've also talked in previous podcasts about the, the difference. And we'll talk about that again. I think uh, when we get a tax accountant in, we should probably talk about the, the difference between tax structure and liability, liability. liability mm. structure because the two of them in some ways can be sort of almost diametrically opposed. So, But in this case, we don't have any particular structure. It's just a bloke who's flicked off a note to a relative 
I, th- I think the lesson from that, if you don't understand the, that uh, lawyers have particular specialties, right, and, and good lawyers pick a specialty or specialties, right, and they just be very, very good at those specialties. But not every lawyer is created the same. So in other words, just because your brother-in-law happens to have a law degree or be admitted as a lawyer doesn't mean they're any skilled in insolvency and dispute resolution when their specialty is actually family law and wills and estates. Like, yeah. you know, it is it is horse for courses. Lawyers have specialties. Not all lawyers are created the same. Just simply just like not all liquidators are created the same. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit like going to a specialist who does sort of like a, your knee and say, look, you know, I've got some really s- trouble with my tummy. Do you reckon you could go out and have a play? I mean, <laughs> it's probably a good chance they'll have a, they'll have a good honest crack at it. That's a good analogy. All, all these medical specialists are all doctors. So they're all branded doctors, just yeah. like you've all branded lawyers, but people within the medical profession have specialties to become a specialist at knees or toes or mouth and nose. That's right. You know. So, I mean, if you had fall over and off your skateboard in the street, they could probably administer a bandage, no problem. Hopefully their PI insurance will cover that. But you see, there's a real case in point of uh, you need to think about, you know, what, what is this letter saying? What do I need to do? And it's tough in the world of spam where you get all sorts of things. You might get texted or emailed. There are things you've got to sort of review in the context of, well, is this a party with whom I've dealt with before? And if it is, is this a legitimate communication? And one thing is to always kind of question, well, if you think it might be legitimate, because there's no harm in phoning them up and asking them if it's legitimate. Yeah, and then if it is legitimate, then you can still dispute it. But in this particular case, he's already—they've already got in this situation a case. At there's an there's an action afoot because they believe that they are an aggrieved party, and there's a matter to be at dispute. So you can't just sit there and ignore it. You mightn't agree with it. Flicking it off to your brother-in-law, as we said, is not a specialist. Isn't a solution. And then, and that's about the role of directors, isn't it? Ultimately, as a director of a company or a business. You are responsible for these things. You can't sign away your obligation as a director. So why I left that with my lawyer? Well, Well, ignorance is not a defence. Ignorance is not a defence. And uh, that could be the same as like, you know, you say, well, I didn't realise I was over the limit officer or I didn't realise I had that extra beer officer. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Ultimately, the responsibility is Mm -hmm. with you. So the good news is that if you get some advice from the right place, and don't ignore stuff and think who would be a good person to tackle this. And it might be asking your accountant or, your, or your, the lawyer who might have done your wills and estates, hey, I know this isn't you, but is there someone I should take this to? Mm. And then query them if they're a person who just does your wills and estates and say, well, is this something with which you're experienced? And if they say, uh, no. <laughs> who would you recommend? Who would you recommend? <laughs> and I think that's the thing about, and I mean, obviously, that's the role of someone like Chris. There's no harm. I mean, nothing would make you happier than people picking up the phone and asking you about, hey, Chris, what do I do here? Who do I talk to? It, uh, I, I say to people all the time, look, come to me with all your problems, uh, except medical ones, of course. Come mm. to me with all your business problems mm. because I may not be the solution, but I genuinely feel I know the person that is. That's right. And I think that's, uh, again, part of the reason why we built the insult panel of which Chris is a, a key member because you go to these people who can direct either manage the process themselves or direct you to the people who can yeah it's been really interesting so what a great news story yeah that was a good news story i I sacked myself basically yeah we sacked ourselves by court order so we're put in by court order sacked ourselves by court order because we believe we didn't need to be there but but a high price had to be paid to get out yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so beware the director. Anyway, <laughs> hey, thanks, Chris. That's been fun. Let's keep talking. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. A reminder that these podcasts are general in nature and do not constitute advice, and they don't take into account your personal circumstances. So if you think, though, that some of the issues raised might apply to you, you should seek qualified financial, legal, or counselling advice. Mm-hmm.